Let's start with a problem. Let's try to find a formula for the number of squares in the following stacks of little squares. We build a sequence of the number of squares as 1, 5, 21, 85, and 341. To make sense of this sequence, we can see that each stack of squares sits inside the next stack of squares, as shown. This means that we'll be able to find a recursive formula for the sequence s sub n. From this we see that s sub n is equal to s sub n minus 1 plus the number of squares in the bottom stack. So we now have an updated question of how many squares there are in the bottom stacks. We can count these to see there's 1, then 4, then 16, then 64, and then 256. You might recognize these as the power of 4, so that these are 4 to the n. We can repeat the recursion over and over and eventually notice that s sub n is therefore the sum of 4 to the i, where i ranges from 0 to n. Can we find a closed formula for this sequence of partial sums? To answer this type of question, we first need to investigate our second family of elementary sequences, those with a common ratio. We call a sequence geometric if the ratio between any pair of successive terms is constant, so that gn divided by gn minus 1 is always a constant value which we'll call r. We can use this formula to rewrite as gn equals r times gn minus 1 and see that this is a recursive formula. Pictorially, we take g0 and we create r copies of g0 to get the next term. Then we create r copies of this to get our next term so that we have r times r g0, but that means we have r squared times g0. We again can take r copies to get our next term, so that we now have r to the third times g0. And we can take r copies again, creating r to the fourth times g0. Our fifth term is obtained by taking r copies again, so that we have r to the fifth times g0. And one more time, we take r copies to see that we now have r to the sixth times g0. Thinking about this process shows us that g sub n is equal to the first term g sub 0 times r to the n. Our pictorial representation suggests a theorem. If g n is a geometric sequence, then there exists a constant value r such that g sub n equals r times g of n minus 1, which is the recursive formula, and g n equals g 0 times r to the n, which is the closed formula. Either of these sequences allow us to build the sequence forever, just knowing the first term and the common ratio r. Let's see some examples. The sequence g sub n given by 1, 3, 9, 27, so on, is a geometric sequence with common ratio r and first term 1, so g sub n equals 1 times 3 to the n. The sequence b sub n equals 10, 50, 250, and so on, is a geometric sequence with r equals 5 and first term 10, so b sub n equals 10 times 5 to the n. Can you find a closed formula for the sequence q sub n given here, assuming that it's geometric? Now that we fully understand geometric sequences, we're ready to find their sequence of partial sums using a process called multiply, shift, and subtract. Our goal is to find a closed form for the sequence of partial sums of a geometric sequence g sub n. Let's start with an example. Let's find the closed form for the sequence of partial sums of the sequence 3 to the n, given here. We're looking for the sum 1 plus 3 plus 3 squared all the way up to 3 to the n. Here's the trick. Use the ratio 3 and multiply the sum that we're interested in by the ratio 3, as shown here. What we end up with is the same sum, pretty much with each power of 3 incremented by 1. The next step is to realize that we have almost the exact same sum as above, but everything is offset. So let's shift this sum over to the right so that the terms line up. And finally, let's subtract the two values that we found term by term. So the first term is negative 2 t of n, then we have 1, then we add 0, and we keep adding 0 term by term because the terms match up in the two different sums, until the very last sum end. Once we get to the end, we see that we're going to subtract off the value of 3 to the n plus 1. Therefore, negative 2 t of n is equal to 1 minus 3 to the n plus 1. And dividing both sides by negative 2 and then multiplying by negative 1 on top and bottom gives us that tn equals 3 to the n plus 1 minus 1 all over 2. This is a closed form for the sequence of partial sums of the sequence that we started with.
A similar process works for all sums of geometric sequences, and so we have our theorem that if gn is a geometric sequence, so that gn equals g times r to the n for some gn r, then the sum of gi, where i ranges from 0 to n, is given by the formula g times r to the n plus 1 minus g, all over the quantity r minus 1. To see why this theorem might be true, let's look at a geometric picture, where we start with a line and we label the points 1, r, r squared, r cubed, and so on, until we finally get to the points r raised to the n and r raised to the n plus 1. Now draw a perpendicular line at 1 that has a length of size g over r minus 1, where g is the first term of the series. We can build the first rectangle of width r minus 1, and we see that it has area g because the r minus 1s cancel. Another rectangle built over the next interval has width r squared minus r, and so it has an area of g times r, since the r minus 1s cancel after we factor out an r. The third rectangle has a width of r cubed minus r squared, and therefore we can find the area to be g r squared because the r minus 1s cancel after factoring out an r squared. We continue this process until we get to the last rectangle, which has a width of r to the n plus 1 minus r to the n. We can factor out an r to the n and cancel the r minus 1s to see the area of this last rectangle to be g times r to the n. Therefore, the area pictured in this diagram is given by the sum of the geometric sequence so that we have g plus gr plus gr squared added up all the way to gr to the n. But there's another way to compute the area of this big rectangle, just thinking of it as a full rectangle, with a width of length r to the n plus 1 minus 1 and a height of g over r minus 1. Therefore, the area is g times r to the n plus 1 minus g all over the quantity r minus 1. Because we computed the area of the same rectangle in two ways, we get the formula from the theorem. And this is true as long as the ratio is not 1. This theorem is often referred to as multiply, shift, and subtract, because that's what we do when we compute the sums and we do it numerically. Let's try another example where we compute the closed form for the sequence of partial sums of the sequence 2 times 5 to the n. In this case, we're looking for the sum g sub n, which is 2 plus 2 times 5 all the way up to 2 times 5 to the n. Again, the ratio is 5, so we can multiply the sum by 5, and we do this term by term so that we basically see that we have almost the exact same summation again. However, if we shift to the right, then the terms really do line up. Finally, we subtract these two sums term by term so that we have minus 4 times gn is equal to 2 plus, and now all of the middle terms will cancel out. We have a zero at each individual place until the very last sum end where we will end up subtracting off 2 times 5 to the n plus 1. After a little bit of algebra and collapsing the terms, we see that g sub n is equal to 2 times 5 to the n plus 1 minus 2 all over 4, as guaranteed by the theorem above. Let's see how to use this theorem to revisit our stacks of squares from the beginning. Recall that we were interested in a closed formula for the number of squares in the following stacks. After counting the number of squares, we realized that we could find a recursion for these numbers and we then use the recursion over and over again to see that s sub n, the number of squares, is the sum of 4 to the i, where i ranges from 0 to n. But now, this is the sum of a geometric sequence with first term 1 and common ratio 4, so we can apply the theorem to see that we have a sum of 4 to the n plus 1 minus 1 all over 4 minus 1. The theorem will always work no matter what the geometric sequence is that you want to find the sum of, but there are other ways for certain sequences as well. Let's see how to do this with the example we just looked at. Let's start with one square, and then let's take three one by one squares so that we have three times four to the zero squares. Follow that up by three two by two squares, which is a total of three times four to the one squares. Then let's take three copies of four by four squares. Each of the four by four squares has 16 little squares, and therefore we have three times four squared squares. We can keep doing this process over and over, where we take three copies of 4 to the n, and they always will create this nice shape here that looks like an upside down L. Finally, we end with three copies of 4 to the n, as we have here. But now we see the interesting part. We can slide these L-shaped pieces all together to form one giant square, especially when we add the final single white square at the end. 
this square is actually four copies of four to the n. And so the total number of squares we see is four times four to the n, which is four to the n plus one. This diagram has thus shown us that one plus three copies of the sum we're interested in is equal to four to the n plus one. We can subtract one and divide by three, and we have seen a visual proof that the sum of four to the i from i equals zero to n is four to the n plus one minus one all over three, just like what was guaranteed for the theorem of multiply, shift, and subtract for finding the sum of geometric sequences.